Hello, this is Rovan again. We will now discuss the issues in the assessment of intelligence. Measured intelligence may vary as a result of factors related to the measurement process. There are many other factors that can cause measured intelligence to vary. The role of culture in measured intelligence. A culture provides specific models for thinking, acting, and feeling. Culture enables people to survive both physically and socially and to master and control the world around them. People from different cultural groups can have radically different views about what constitutes intelligence because values may differ radically between cultural and subcultural groups. Test takers from different cultural groups can be expected to bring to a test situation differential levels of ability, achievement, and motivation. Consider an experiment conducted with children who were members of a rural community in eastern Zambia. Sapel tested Zambian and English research subjects on a task involving the reconstruction of models using pencil and paper, clay, or wire. The English children did best on the paper and pencil reconstructions because those were the materials with which they were most familiar. By contrast, the Zambian children did best using wire because that was the medium with which they were most familiar. Both groups of children did about equally well using clay. Items on a test of intelligence tend to reflect the culture of the society where the test is employed. To the extent that a score on such a test reflects the degree to which test takers have been integrated into the society and the culture, it would be expected that members of subcultures would score lower. Blacks and Native Americans tend to score lower on intelligence tests than whites or Asians. As Gu He and Sikin have observed, cultural differences with respect to the conceptualization of intelligence extend to culturally appropriate ways of expressing intelligence. People in the West may be culturally accustomed to expressions of intelligence in the form of writing, speech, debate, and the like. By contrast, in the East, where modesty is culturally valued, such overt demonstrations of one's intellectual prowess may be culturally discouraged. It is explained that a component of intelligence in the East has to do with the ability to exhibit culturally appropriate restraint in display of ability. Lao Ziyi, the philosopher who founded Taoism, in his work Tao Te Ching informs the extent to which a general demeanor of caution and moderation is not only culturally preferable, but seen as the more intelligent option. Alfred Binet shared with many others the desire to develop a measure of intelligence as untainted as possible by factors such as prior education and economic advantages. This desire to create what might be termed a culture-free intelligence test has resurfaced with various degrees of fervor throughout history. One assumption inherent in the development of such tests is that if cultural factors can be controlled, then differences between cultural groups will be lessened. A related assumption is that the effect of culture can be controlled through the elimination of verbal items and the exclusive reliance on nonverbal performance items. Nonverbal items were thought to represent the best available means for determining the cognitive ability of minority group children and adults. However, they have not been found to have the same high level of predictive validity as more verbally loaded tests and are not very good at predicting success in various academic and business settings. The idea of developing a truly culture-free test has had great intuitive appeal but has proven to be a practical impossibility. All tests of intelligence reflect, to a greater or lesser degree, the culture in which they were devised and will be used. Stated another way, intelligence tests differ in the extent to which they are culture-loaded. Culture-loading may be defined as the extent to which a test incorporates the vocabulary, concepts, traditions, knowledge, and feelings associated with a particular culture. Soon after it became evident that no test could legitimately be called culture-free, a number of tests referred to as culture fair began to be published. We may define a culture fair intelligence test as a test or assessment process designed to minimize the influence of culture with regard to various aspects of the evaluation procedures, such as administration instructions, item content, responses required of test takers, and interpretations made from the resulting data. The rationale for culture fair test items was to include only those tasks that seem to reflect experiences, knowledge, and skills common to all different cultures. 
In addition, all the tasks were designed to be motivating to all groups. Culture fair tests are also tended to be nonverbal and to have simple, clear directions administered orally by the examiner. The nonverbal tasks typically consisted of assembling, classifying, selecting, or manipulating objects and drawing or identifying geometric designs. Here are some sample items from the Cattell Culture Fair test. The Culture Fair Intelligence Test was created by Raymond Cattell in 1949 as an attempt to measure cognitive abilities devoid of sociocultural and environmental influences. The Culture Fair tests consist of three scales with nonverbal visual puzzles. Scale I includes eight subtests of mazes, copying symbols, identifying similar drawings and other nonverbal tasks. Both scales 2 and 3 consist of four subtests that include completing a sequence of drawings, a classification subtest where respondents pick a drawing that is different from other drawings, a matrix subtest that involves completing a matrix of patterns, and a condition subtest which involves which, out of several geometric designs, fulfills a specific given condition. Raven's matrices is a nonverbal ability test used to assess abstract reasoning. The test is progressive in the sense that questions get harder as the test progresses. The task is to determine the missing element in a pattern which is generally presented in the form of a matrix, hence the name. The tests were originally developed by John C. Raven in 1936. Reducing culture loading of intelligence tests seems to lead to a parallel decrease in the value of the test. Culture fair tests have been found to lack predictive validity. Not only that, minority group members still tended to score lower on these tests than did majority group members. Frustrated by their seeming inability to develop culture fair equivalents of traditional intelligence tests, some test developers attempted to develop equivalents of traditional intelligence tests that were culture-specific. One culture-specific intelligence test developed expressly for use with African Americans was the Black Intelligence Test of Cultural Homogeneity. It is a 100-item multiple-choice test. Here are three sample items. In what was probably one of the few published studies designed to explore the test validity, the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale and the Black Intelligence Test of Cultural Homogeneity were both administered to black and white applicants for a job with the Portland, Oregon, Police Department. The black subjects performed much better on the test than did the white subjects. The white mean IQ as measured by the Wexler scale exceeded the black mean IQ. Even though the black sample overall mean on the Wexler scale was about 20 points higher than for blacks in general, their scores on the black intelligence test fell below the average of the standardization sample. What, then, is the black intelligence test measuring? The study authors, Matarazzo and Wines, concluded that the test was measuring a variable that could be characterized as streetwiseness. Many of the tests designed to be culture-specific did yield higher mean scores for the minority group for which they were specifically designed. Still, they lacked predictive validity and provided little useful, practical information. The Flynn effect is thus a shorthand reference to the progressive rise in intelligence test scores that is expected to occur on a norm test intelligence from the date when the test was first normed. According to James Flynn, the exact amount of the rise in IQ will vary as a function of several factors, such as how culture-specific the items are and whether the measure used is one of fluid or crystallized intelligence. A test will overestimate an individual's IQ score by an average of about 0.3 points per year between the year in which the test was normed and the year in which the test was administered. One research paper, published by psychologist Lisa Trahan and her colleagues, combined the results of other published studies which included a total of over 14,000 participants and found that IQ scores have indeed increased since the 1950s. Researchers have put forward several theories to explain the Flynn effect. One explanation has to do with improvements in health and nutrition. For example, the past century has seen a decrease in smoking and alcohol use in pregnancy, discontinuation of the use of harmful lead paint, improvements in the prevention and treatment of infectious diseases, and improvements in nutrition. The Flynn effect could be partially due to the fact that, over the 20th century, we've started addressing many of the public health issues that prevented people in earlier generations from reaching their full potential. Another explanation for the Flynn effect has to do with societal changes that have occurred in the past century as a result of the Industrial Revolution. 
Flynn explains that the world today is a world where we've had to develop new mental habits, new habits of mind. Flynn has found that IQ scores have increased the most rapidly on questions that ask us to find similarities between different things and more abstract types of problem solving, both of which are things that we need to do more of in the modern world. Several ideas have been put forward to explain why modern society might lead to higher scores on IQ tests. For example, today, many more of us have demanding, intellectually rigorous jobs. Schools have also changed. Additionally, more people today are likely to finish high school and go on to college. It's even been suggested that the entertainment we consume is more complex today. Trying to understand and anticipate plot points in a favorite book or TV drama may actually be making us smarter. The consequences of this effect are especially pertinent to the diagnosis of intellectual disability in high-stakes decisions when an IQ cut point is used as a necessary part of the decision-making process. This includes the determination of intellectual disability in capital punishment cases. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled it illegal to execute a person who suffers from mental retardation. From a less applied and more academic perspective, consideration of the Flynn effect can be used to shed light on theories and to help support or disprove them. For example, Cattell wrote that fluid intelligence, which is a product of heredity, form the basis for crystallized intelligence which is a product of learning and the environment. If Cattell was correct, we might expect generational gains in IQ to be due to increased crystallized intelligence, this is a result of factors such as improvements in education, greater educational opportunities for people, and greater cognitive demands in the workplace. The Flynn effect tells us that IQ may not actually be what we think it is, instead of being a measure of natural, unlearned intelligence, it's something that can be shaped by the education we receive and the society we live in. The evaluation of a test's construct validity proceeds on the assumption that one knows in advance exactly what the test is supposed to measure. For intelligence tests, it is essential to understand how the test developer defined intelligence. If, for example, intelligence were defined in a particular intelligence test as Spearman's G, then we would expect factor analysis of this test to yield a single large common factor. By contrast, if intelligence were defined by a test developer in accordance with Guilford's theory, then no one factor would be expected to dominate. Instead, one would anticipate many different factors reflecting a diverse set of abilities. Recall that in Guilford's structure of intellect theory, an individual's performance on intelligence tests can be traced back to the underlying mental abilities or factors of intelligence. The SI theory comprises up to 180 different intellectual abilities organized along three dimensions, operations, content, and products. A compromise between Spearman and Guilford is Thorndike. Thorndike's theory of intelligence leads us to look for one central factor reflecting G along with three additional factors representing social, concrete, and abstract intelligences. In this case, an analysis of the test's construct validity would ideally suggest that test takers' responses to specific items reflected in part a general intelligence, but also different types of intelligence, social concrete and abstract. So many decades after the publication of the 1921 symposium, professionals still debate the nature of intelligence and how it should be measured. In the wake of the controversial book The Bell Curve, the American Psychological Association commissioned a panel to write a report on intelligence that would carry psychology's official imprimatur. The panel's report reflected wide disagreement with regard to the definition of intelligence, but noted that such disagreements are not cause for dismay. Scientific research rarely begins with fully agreed definitions, though it may eventually lead to them. Another issue that is not going to go away concerns group differences in measured intelligence. Human beings certainly do differ in size, shape, and color, and it is thus reasonable to consider that there is also a physical basis for differences in intellectual ability. Claims about group differences can and have been used as political and social tools to oppress religious, ethnic, or other minority group members. Arthur Jensen observed that variance attributable to group differences is far less than variance attributable to individual differences. Echoing this sentiment is the view that what matters for the next person you meet is that person's own particular score, not the mean of some reference group to which he or she happens to belong. 
The relationship between intelligence and a wide range of social outcomes has been well documented. Measured intelligence is negatively correlated with socially undesirable outcomes such as juvenile crime. For these and related reasons, we would do well to concentrate research attention on the environmental end of the heredity environment spectrum. Intelligence has endured and will continue to endure as a key construct in psychology and psychological assessment. For this reason, professionals who administer intelligence tests have a great responsibility, one for which thorough preparation is a necessity.